Right. So, uh, so this week we're going to be talking about social media advertising. Um, last week we spoke about Google AdWords and search advertising. Uh, so this week's the companion, the companion week with that. Um, before we make a start, are there are there any questions on on the on the search marketing stuff or the search advertising stuff? I think Lucy and Danny, we, neither of you were here last week, were you? Yeah, I had one of those days where I just couldn't stop what I was doing. <laughs> Sorry. I want to no, I'll review it, though. I'll watch it back because I'm interested. It's not really an area I know much about. So, yeah, no, no yeah, worries at all. No worries at all. As, as you know, for everyone, this is, don't, if you can't make it, you can't make it. Please don't. No, absolutely no need to apologize at all. The only reason I mention it is because... Um, I think I mentioned at the start of last week's course that in a way that search advertising and social advertising, typically a good paid advertising strategy would incorporate both of them. Um, I, won't, I won't sort of go over the, the slides again, but we, what, um, the way to think about it is search advertising is, is, a, is an excellent way of responding to user initiated interest. Because if a user types something into a search engine, it means they want some answers back. Um, and, and that's why search advertising, typically, you will get higher click-through rates. So if you're shown on a search result page 100 times, you might, you know, if, you, if you're top of the advertising list, then you, you might get a click-through rate of 10% or 5% or something like that. Social media advertising is a bit more interruptive when people are on social. They're not, the, the, the sorts of advertising that they're engaged with typically is not what they're there for. Um, so you can reach loads of people because with social advertising, as we'll see, you just describe the person and, and we can do that in various ways. And, and then, you can, then you can reach them with that form of advertising. But because it's interruptive, the click-through rates will typically be much lower, more like you know, 0.5% or even lower than that. Um, you know, so it, but it's not that social is good or, and search is bad or, or vice versa. They both work together. Social advertising is really good at reaching the right people based on, uh, on how we can describe them. Search advertising is good at responding. And then similarly, we can use social advertising to remarket to that audience so we can go back to warm audiences with follow-up messages. And so, and so that's a, a long way of saying that search advertising and social advertising, they definitely go together in, in a sort of joined up strategy. Don't think of them as, as one or the other. So having said all that, are there any sort of questions about uh, any general questions before we get going? No, oh, not for me. I'm just going to have to turn off my video because the connection is quite bad, but I am here. Okay, cool, Emily. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a delay. That's all right. Okay. All right, I'll start sharing my screen. And as always, uh, please jump in and ask a question. As we go. Okay, so this is unbelievably, this is week six. So six weeks in, and we're, today we're gonna to be talking about social media advertising. So I'll start off with some, some sort of general, you know, thought provoking questions. So why do you paid social? Well, there are various reasons and here, here's some of them. Um, as we mentioned, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a good way of building brand awareness because if your particular brand or your organization wants to reach a particular um, audience types, audience groups, if we can define those audiences, it's very likely that using the social media channels, you know, we can reach them. And, and you know, if we get the messaging right, we can build positive brand awareness, brand affinity by using social advertising. You'll remember from the organic, um, uh, from the organic social media marketing week, we looked at the sort of pe the penetration of these social networks and it's, you know, it's very, very close to, to nearly everyone in the UK and, you know, and, and many other markets, social media penetration is enormous now. Um, uh, obviously our customers are there. So in the most, for most of us, you know, we want to be there too. Um, and again, if we, we don't necessarily need to know who our customers are, we just need to know how to describe them and then we can reach uh, new ones. Um, there is you know, the ability to generate leads and actual conversions. 
and you know we'll talk about how we can do that later on and yeah in general social media advertising can be seen as as, as a way of creating a multi-channel campaign so that multiple digital channels but also we can dovetail it with with offline advertising as well and then this final one here is then so we spoke um, a few weeks ago about social media marketing the organic version um, and we're saying that social media advertising you know doesn't necessarily need to be connected to what we're doing from an organic perspective which is more about marketing to our existing network and people who are connected to us in an existing way it can help it and this slide here um you know this this shows the very very thin little light blue line here is the organic impressions for an organic post and and one way to do social advertising and it's not really we're not really going to focus on this tactic um today apart from on this slide is just to simply just to boost your organic post. And the thinking here is that if you've got an organic post that's working quite well with your own network and then you boost it, um, what the algorithms will typically do, the advertising algorithms is boost it to um, profiles that look similar to your existing network. And it's a good way of, of it's a soft way, I guess, um, and, and relatively user-friendly way of increasing the reach of your organic content. So the, the darker blue line there is saying, you know, with, with, a, with a certain amount of money, you can take a post that's generating a few hundred impressions per day to, you know, to up to 10,000. And this number here, so, you know, it, let's assume we, we get, you know, to 100,000 impressions because a typical CPM, meaning a cost per 1,000 impressions, um, yeah, it's around five pounds. Obviously, it depends on the audience, depends on the platform, but five pounds is, is a reasonably accurate number. Then for, for, uh, for 500 pounds, you can reach 100,000 impressions. So if your typical post you know, is reaching you know, one or 2,000, for a relatively low cost, you can significantly increase uh, you know, that reach. Now, that's not in itself a reason to do it but it's, it's just to just to say that you know you can significantly increase reach <clears throat> we touched on this a couple of weeks ago um and as marketers we we you know this is this is not necessarily a good well, it's not a good thing but we we need to be aware of it um on facebook not just facebook but all of the other you know most um social media platforms as they've developed their advertising capability over the last few years. And as more and more advertisers have gone on to that platform, it's, um, it's led to obviously the platforms need to make space for the advertising. And typically what they've lost in order to make space for the advertising is, is the exposure to the organic posts that, you know, the, that we as advertisers are creating for our brand pages or, you know, or, or, our, or via our influencer channels. And, and so at one point, you know, sort of, you know, nearly 10 years ago, we might have expected more than 15% of our existing network to, to see uh, our existing, our, our content that we post organically, you know, and some normalized data suggests that that's down now to around 2%. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. Okay, I'll go, I'll go through a few more slides and then we'll drop in and, and open up a discussion. So campaign strategy and planning so I'll, I'll talk generally here and then we'll go in and have a Q&A and then we'll we'll finish off the session by looking in a bit more detail at exactly what uh, what things look like in Facebook and Instagram and we'll, we'll do LinkedIn as well so we cover B2C and B2B I'll talk generally for now and we'll introduce some concepts so there are lots of platforms out there obviously the big ones are Facebook Instagram LinkedIn for B2B, Twitter can underpin both, and YouTube, which is part of the, the Google Ads platform. Um, Snapchat historically has been a platform for, for reaching um, certain demographics, specifically younger, younger people, but TikTok's definitely the up-and-coming player there, and this is Pinterest, which is also swiftly developing its advertising capabilities, and there are more than this. Um, when when we run advertising, we'll see this when we look, we'll see how, 
how this works when we look at in detail at Facebook and Instagram, but you can, um, well, you need, you would need, you would want an objective to underpin what you're doing and advertising anyway. But as we see in the platforms, you can actually spit, pick specific objectives and then goals that underpin those objectives. But in general, it's one of these three categories. So awareness typically is about reaching people who we don't already have a connection with. So we're trying to create awareness with you know, suspects. So suspects, someone who's right for us, um, we've got the right service for them, they're the right customer for us, but they don't know us and we don't know them. So a great way, it really is a good way of creating awareness amongst that group of people. And then c consideration, this is the people you know, who do know us, they might have engaged with our content um, and we want, to, we want to nurture them and create a few more touch points and bring them further down the funnel. And then the actual conversion. So this is, the, this is if we, and next week we'll be talking about Google Analytics and we can set up goals, which typically are, I want someone to buy something from my website or I want someone to take a specific action on my website for a B2B company, it might be fill out a form. Um, it might be go to a contact page and make contact. Um, and using Google Analytics, we can, in, in many cases, we can actually track when those things happen. And if we've got that set up on analytics, whatever ad platform we're using, we can connect those two things, which is called tracking. And, and then we can track the performance of our, of our ad campaigns and even individual ads. And so it is possible to drive conversions with social media advertising. And actually, in reality, if you're talking about an organizational strategy, you would have campaigns that work on awareness, campaigns that work in consideration, and campaigns, campaigns that work in conversion, obviously all running simultaneously, because you might say, look, I just want sales, but in order to get sales over the longer term, you, you obviously need the other two things. But I think we're all, we're all there already. And again, you know, if we're going for awareness, think about the relevant metrics. Typically, if we're going for awareness, it's about how much reach we get, so how many impressions, and then the quality, uh, I guess the quality factor of that, because you know, reach by itself is you know, great, reach is reach, but what is the cost per, per thousand impressions? And so what we want to do is maximize the reach, but minimize the cost. Yeah, and for the people who, who, were, who, who were on the session last week and, and Danny and Lucy, you know, we, we spoke about how AdWords works as a marketplace and it's really, it's really very, very similar for social advertising. So not every advertiser will pay the same cost per click. There is a quality factor as well, which rates up or down the, the cost that we pay as an advertiser. Typically, if we're creating good quality advertising, which broadly for the platforms means if the user is engaging with it um, over a period of time, then we will be rewarded by having a lower cost per click than if we create low quality advertising. And so that's how you can, you can optimize your, your cost per impressions in the case of awareness. If you're talking about engagement, typically it's clicks or some form of action. So it'd be clicks and then cost per click. Um, and over time, we want to maximize the clicks at, at, and optimize you know, reduce the cost per click as far as possible. And then conversions, you know, it's those conversion actions that actually take place on our website. Uh, so how many times is that goal fired from ads that, that came from the relevant campaigns? And then, and then how much in total, you know, does that cost? And the way that you work that out is you add up the total cost for the campaign, you add up the number of conversions, you divide one number by the other and it gives you a cost per conversion. Uh, we'll break off for a and a in a second here, but the, but the important thing to say is this. So if you, when we go into our social advertising, if we've got a clear plan in terms of, you know, obviously the objectives and the goals that underpin each one of those objectives, and we can describe our audience and we can commit to some form of budget, then the benefits of, one of the great benefits of, of these platforms is that, you know, we as marketeers, digital agency specialists and freelance specialists have the ability to go into the ad platforms and interrogate historical data, either ideally for that account, but even if you're a new advertiser, um, you get access to um, uh, 
you know, to, to historical data on the platforms um, and that's anonymized, obviously, but it will give it to you for your sector and for your audience. And it will give you an estimated cost per impression, cost per click, and potentially even cost per conversion. So in advance, you can see quite a long way about how much, how much what sort of results you'll get for a given campaign. So being clear about these, these three things, budget, audience, goals, in advance, you can go to an agency specialist and say, what can I get for this audience, budget, goals, objectives? And, and these, are the, these are the three things. So, you know, what are, what are our objectives, goals? And look, if it's a big, you know, annual strategy, then as we mentioned, there'll be a number of them. Um, but if there is a specific campaign that we want to run, you know, what is the objective of that campaign? How much money have we got? And then if we can describe our audience, even just high level based on, on a few questions here, you don't even, you know, describe them in whatever way you want, then we can go and interrogate the platforms and we can find out which channels uh, would work for that given audience. As I mentioned, what would be the likely number of impressions, clicks or conversions, depending on what our goal is, and then what are the costs for those things. And, and so you can get the channels and results just by supplying some upfront information and then off the back of what you see here, if, it, if you want to take the next step and actually advertise, then you build out a targeting and messaging strategy. And we'll talk about how that stuff works um, in the next section. But before we go there, let's let's uh, let me stop talking now for a while. And we'll we'll. This is a starter question. I'm really interested to understand if what people here think. Now there are some businesses who are moot. There are some businesses who already are at the point where they have so much visibility, and th and they're oftentimes e-commerce businesses. They have so much visibility about how, how much they can spend on a particular channel, how many impressions they get, how many clicks they'll get, and then how many conversions they'll get on their website, that they are actually viewing digital advertising as a, as a profit center activity, meaning if you put a thousand pounds in, you get 2000 pounds back. Um, I'm interested to understand if for your, because most organizations can't, they don't, they, they, just can't see right to the end of, of, of the, you know, of what the user is going to do, not least because in most cases, you know, um, yes, we might bring a customer into the business, but we never know how long they're going to stay or what, what they're going to do. But I'm interested to understand if you think, given what you know about social advertising, that your organization could get to this point um, and or any other question, insight, thought that you want to share. You would like to go first. I don't mind going first. Um, when it comes, because we are very um, B two B, I think the, I think LinkedIn is probably definitely the most relevant. Um, maybe with a little bit of Twitter in there as well. But I don't honestly see our marketplace being in the likes of Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or anything like that. I just. Uh, even if there was a, uh, some sort of market presence, I think our market is so niche that. It just people wouldn't even dream of looking looking us up there, or we wouldn't find us relevant to, to be there. So it'd be interesting to see some of the costings around how you said five pounds. Um, is that an overall um, average, or including LinkedIn, or does LinkedIn tend to be maybe slightly more expensive because it is a little bit more targeted? Yeah, I think no, you're you've hit the nail on the head, Neil. It is more expensive. The cost per impressions and the cost per clicks um it's pretty significantly more expensive than facebook as you would expect in a way it's, yeah. it's like five times the price right. okay. so that so that the cpm of, of facebook at five pounds is that's the cost per thousand impressions a typical cost per click on facebook um you know again it depends on the audience but yeah you know, it might be 10p it might be 50p would be relatively high Whereas on LinkedIn, it's very easy to see a five pound cost per click or even more. Right. Okay. Um, but, but like I said, the thing about the way to think about the advertising, whether it's AdWords or social, it's not so much about the cost per click. It's more ultimately, it's more about the cost per conversion. Yeah. Because if, you, yeah. You know, if you're spending 50 pounds to get a client that's worth 100,000, then clearly it's, no, it's a no brainer. If you're selling, you know, if, you, if you're selling, you know, sharp, pencil sharpeners, yeah, you might think twice. 
So it's all relative. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Emily, do you if you have you got any thoughts? Um how 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 um you guys are using social advertising, obviously. How much insight do you have on how that works? I have a, I have a little bit. Daisy is the expert, um, as you say. So for us, see Facebook and Instagram are big markets for us because ours is very B2C. It's sort of an impulse purchase um, that kind of goes with sort of the casual activity that you usually get through scrolling through like social media. Um, from a, We do paid advertising. Um, and that's just to increase our reach. But I think what's more important for us is brand awareness. So yes, whilst it's, it can be seen as a profit centre because ultimately you get something out of it. We hope, I think we like to think that even if people aren't directly buying something out of it, whether it's a product online or visiting one of our stores, that it, it kind, of, kind of subconsciously converts to more awareness of who Canoops are and what we do and maybe down the line, it can, you know, someone might recommend us or sort of think, oh, walk past, let's go and have a visit. I've, I've seen them online. So I think that is one of the primary uh, reasons for us doing social advertising. Yeah. And the awareness thing is really important um, and by itself is valuable. But yeah. then it becomes even more tangibly valuable when, when you, because if you're running awareness campaigns and at the same time, you have campaigns that are more focused on engagement or, or even conversion, then one of the ways, and we'll sort of talk about this in the next section, but you can build out um, what's called custom audiences. And you can say, from my awareness advertising, I've advertised to a million people who, you know, who like chocolate or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then of that million people, um, although it was awareness-focused advertising, we can we can see that there you know there might have been ten thousand so one percent of people engaged with the ad in some way or if it was a video watched more yeah. than fifty percent of the video or you can specify you know engagement you can define it in many ways but you can you can explicitly say right well, I want to take that subset of people and then run this conversion focused ad which says uh, you know you, you've been selected for you know for special offer three months free you know shipments. If yeah. you sign up in the next 10 days or whatever with this code. And so the awareness marketing serves two purposes. It, it creates awareness, but it also allows you to build out remarketing audiences where you can do really clever things with. Yeah. Um, and although I don't have an insight into actually how that side of thing works, I, I, I hear about it, but I know that is incredibly valuable, valuable to us. And they are trying to tap into more markets because it's predominantly been sort of a more... 30s into middle age products but they are trying to tap into um younger audiences with it by refocusing their marketing yeah and, that, and that's a really good point so you can um you know last week we were talking about if, if you remember you know campaigns ad groups and ads so ad group at the ad group level is where you do your targeting so if we've traditionally been targeting people in their 30s and 40s then we can we can replicate we can take an ad group out duplicate it and then just change the targeting parameters so we're we're targeting people you know in their 20s and obviously we alter the messaging and we alter the creative and and, that, and you know and and so that's how you can get granular around not it's not just a blanket message it's obviously we've got different messages for all the different groups yeah so it's good for that thank you for pointing that out yeah thanks sorry go on no, that's fine thank you it's actually, Neil, I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I didn't point out as well. It, it, you, on the face of it, you are right, right? LinkedIn and Twitter for B2B, Facebook and Instagram, and potentially also Twitter for B2C. But in, in our experience, in, in our team's experiences, we quite often get surprised at how occasionally Facebook, Facebook specifically, not less so Instagram, it can work for businesses. Um, in, 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 in terms of the way that you're targeting individuals, because the, the targeting capabilities of Facebook, um, of all of the platforms, it is, it is like you can be the most granular on Facebook and Instagram. So although it's not really a place to do business absolutely agreed, um, certainly B2B industry sectors, you can target those 
people in their in their personal lives, I guess, very, very, very accurately. And then if you tie that with something like a LinkedIn campaign or a remarketing campaign, you can actually get value, even if you're a B2B business. Can I just ask a quick question, Elliot? Um, so when, when you say that you can really quite accurately target somebody, um, for example, could you um, kind of target people that work at a specific company within a specific area? Um, uh, yes, is, is yeah. the answer. I mean, in the next in the next section, I'll sort of talk in a bit more detail about how this works. But but yes. Yeah, you see, that's really interesting because as far as um, social media um, and LinkedIn from, from for gaining new clients in order to get us profit, um, in, in all honesty, I don't, I, I, I can't see it actually working too well for us. Um, and that obviously with, with LinkedIn, you can you can target and con and, and promote to sustainability professionals. Um, but in kind of our experience, the people that actually want to spend the money are people that are specifically looking for a solution to their problem. Um, so search engine optimization, that kind of thing has always historically worked a little bit better. Um, but but one thing that I think could work really, really well, but obviously it, de it would depend on the costings, is so we create communities for organisations and the success of that community is based on how many users actually sign up to that community. So employees effectively of that organization um, that are gonna use the community, they're gonna connect together, they're gonna walk, they're gonna cycle and they're gonna carpool with one another. So it'd be really interesting to, to perhaps even try a campaign targeted actually at the specific users of a community to see whether we can drive usage of the community, which actually in turn would benefit us in the long term anyway. Yeah. I so really, there's loads of really good points you've raised there. Is it all right, Lucy? Can I give some of the context about what you're doing just for the benefit of Yeah, of yeah, Danny sorry, and please do, yeah, Elliot. So, yeah. So of, of everyone on this call, I would say it's probably fair to say. Um, Neil won't be too far behind, but, but Lucy's organization, because it's selling corporate carpooling solutions to big organizations like who, who, who are going to have you know, thousands probably of workers and, and, and they need a solution to take them from a train station to, to, to a specific location in a, in a large sort of plant. And that might be a university campus or hospital campus. Is that right, Lucy? Yeah, absolutely. So once they sign up, um, someone like that, and you can imagine that that's a purchase that's going to take multiple years, actually, um, you know, before before a large organization buys a, a solution like that. But then once they do sign up for the solution, it's the actual people who are going on these carpooling or these transport pooling um, uh, solutions that, that, you know, that, that um, Toyota will be, Kinto will be providing. Um, they they then be almost become ambassadors for the service because they'll use the app and they'll they'll be sort of signing up and joining up and so and so on and so forth. But then when they move company, they're then potential influencers for the new company that might be similar to sign up for a similar service. And so what you're suggesting, I think, Lucy, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you can create more engagement, not just use the app from a functional perspective, but also talk about it, you know communicate about it yeah. you then piggyback on their own network yeah also yeah, yeah exactly that Elliot um but but also more specifically so um so our aim when, when we sign up a client who has made the decision to 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 take on board Kinto join um they want as many as their employees as possible to join that community because they want to either reduce their carbon emissions, um, they want to reduce overcrowding in their car parks, for example. So their goal and our goal is to make sure that that community has as many as their employees in as possible. So as typical promotion within those communities, we would normally set, um, do poster templates, email templates, plasma screen um information um but to actually so the more it grows the more successful it will be and that's what we want that's what the client wants and that will that's what will make sure that they keep coming back to us year after year and 
to be able to target specific users within a specific organization through social media that could actually be a fantastic way of promotion not only for that specific community but like you say to to get people talking about it if they move to another company they can say oh we use kinto join at this company and it, it so exactly that but but specifically from the onset to actually grow the community um which is going to make it a success and when it is a success it's naturally going to be spoken about anyway yeah Look, I think, I think, look, it's just, it's almost like yes to all of the above, isn't it? It's, it's funny because your, your colleague who's on the Wednesday session, Hannah, I think was, I think was also saying something similar a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about organic social. So I don't know if you've already spoken about it. If you haven't, you oh, definitely that's should. that's interesting. Because it, because I'll it's, have to it, pick up with her on that. You should, yeah, because it's, it's a definite, like, but what I would say is in terms of the only issue with something like social advertising, particularly if you're talking about, um, a, 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 a product or a service which has a long sales cycle, you know, like you do, like Neil will have, you know, da Danny, you know, the, the universities typically 18 months, it's still, still long. It, it, it's like, it's, it's not really something I would necessarily recommend you just give it a go. It's, it needs to be intertwined into, into a broader strategy, really, because it's, it's the sort of thing that you're only really going to see value from in the longer term. So it's almost like, what are all the things we need to do to nurture the communities, to get interest from the actual decision makers, which, as you say, are not necessarily going to be the people who are sitting in carpooling solutions. They're probably not going to be. It's like a completely different audience. Yeah. Um, but they're all part of the same. Marcom strategy needs to pull together all of the, the people who are going to influence the sale to the people actually going to make the decision. And there's probably layers between them. And then there's different channels that we would use. But all of it needs to kind of um, needs to kind of sing together, so to speak, and and it needs to be run strategically over a period of time, rather than just oh, I'll give that a go for this audience and I'll try something else over here, um, which is often easier said than done. But ideally, that's the way you do it. Yeah. So I don't want to say don't try it, you know, do, but think about it in the context of your broader strategy. Yeah. Before you dive in. <laughs> I've got a question for you, if you don't mind, Elliot. Um, you mentioned about saying LinkedIn is, for B2B, is definitely head and shoulders, but don't discount Facebook because they can be, get into the granular detail. How are they able to do that? Because my experience of Facebook is that people would very rarely put down the company or the industry that they actually work in. So how would Facebook be able to... Um, narrow down who my target market is? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's also a mildly loaded question because um, <laughs> because Facebook Facebook um, when it when it uh, right, it's, it's not selling our data directly to advertisers. It's selling access to us to advertisers. When it's doing that, it's not just relying on what we put in our profile. It's not even just relying on what we do when we're on the Facebook platform. Although it does rely on that a lot. But it, it's taking in, you've got to remember, Facebook pixels are sitting all over websites everywhere. So it's, it's taking, it's got a very, very detailed view of us as individuals, which is a wider question, actually, and one that, you know, is, as a society, we, we kind of are, <coughs> no doubt will be more. But um, it's, it's going to, uh, it, it's going it's to have to, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It, um, it knows a lot more about us than what we put in our profile. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It, it, it is crazy though, Facebook. Um, it, it the information that it knows it staggers me, um, I, and I don't know how it does it. So it comes up with <coughs> ads and and uh, um, different promotions based on on my phone, based on what other people may have searched for in the house so it, it's obviously linked to to your internet or 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 some kind of way to your cookies and it it knows so much information about you and everybody in your house it's actually quite scary so it doesn't surprise me that that it can reach though that, that kind of specific people don't let google have access to your microphone <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. No, it really does. I mean, yeah, look, that's a whole, that's a whole like topic. We could have a, a day to, it's funny because obviously I work, I work, I, <laughs> I've opened I, a can of worms. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we last, um, we're not going to talk about it specifically today, but while we're on the sub, so Gmail advertising is a thing like for anyone who uses Gmail, there's an advertising tab and, and that advertising is quite effective because it can be really targeted. And the reason it can be targeted is because it's got AI reading your emails, the contents of the emails that you send, the contents of the emails that you come back. So it knows if you're planning a wedding, if you're going to have a baby, if you're going to be graduating from university, these, these so-called life event targeting uh, features, you know, G Gmail has that, Facebook has that as well. Um, because they're reading, they're reading all of the content that you're writing and sharing and being sent. And, you know, and like Danny says, although there's no official word on whether it's listening to us, I, I, I think it would almost be, um, it would almost be rude of them not to be dark testing it, because when it does become legal, they want to be ready to go with, you know, with the solutions. I mean, that's, that why I might just be reaching a little bit there but I, I wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all um <laughs> i think that just just going back just going back neil to your question so the way to think about it is this so if you're saying as an organization for example i want to spend ten thousand pounds or a hundred thousand pounds or a million doesn't really matter what the budget is but if you sort of make a a sort of strategic decision that i want to spend x amount of money on social media advertising, instead of going to your, to your agency or your freelance and say, put it all on LinkedIn, it, it's better to say, this is my objective, these are my audience, and this is, um, this is my budget. Given that, what channel mix do you think would work? Because remember, a campaign strategy is a strategy, is lots and lots of campaigns, depending, normally depending on the budget, the bigger the budget, the more campaigns, the more ad groups, the more ads. But they all work. They're all designed to work together. So you cover the awareness bit, the, the consideration bit and the conversion bit. And it might be that different channels can interact very well. So, for example, Facebook might be a very good channel for opening up awareness with suspects. And then you take that audience that have interacted with your ads and then you reach them on a platform like LinkedIn. So you're almost like fine tuning your convert your right. middle, your middle of the funnel audience. Um, and that example I've given you, you know, that's that's quite you know typical for it's a typical sort of strategy that an agency like Mint Twist and others would be running for for big advertisers. You know, with, you know universities are a good example of organisations that rely on on digital advertising to to help them to hit their targets. Most of them do, and they need to use different channels for different purposes. Okay, thank you. Oh, pleasure. Good questions. Any any more? thoughts or questions we're going to ask i know it's a little bit off topic but um what what's your general consensus on using influencers um to sort of boost your impressions i know they're not really paid well they are a form of paid advertising but not always in the sense that this is yeah it's a really good question um it's a really really good question so so mince twist has like Mint Swiss and myself have some experience of influencers. So I'm not, but not a huge amount. So I'm not speaking yeah. from a point of huge authority here. Um, however, it, because obviously we're a full service agency. So we are now investing in a relationship with um, what's called um, an influencer network system. So if you're not familiar with them, there are a whole bunch of uh, platforms that have, have popped up and they're you know, mostly in North America and there are some in Europe uh, and, and we've sort of selected a, a partner that we're, that we're trialing now at the moment. And the way this works is there are obviously influencers in all sorts of sectors all over the world and they, they will jump on these, these platforms and effectively they're marketplaces. So if I'm an influencer and I'm authoritative you know, on, on the film industry in the UK, then I might want to meet with advertisers who... who who I think who who I think we can have a mutually beneficial uh, sort of relationship with in with, and and instead of spending the countless days, weeks, and months trying to find every single advertiser who might be interested in working with me 
as if I was an influencer, influential on the film industry in the UK, I can go on these platforms, put, connect my channels, say sort of the, the topics that I talk about and the channels that I use. And then when a, an advertiser comes on or you know, an advertiser asks their agency to search influencers, instead of, again, spending weeks and months and trying to find these people and never really doing it, you go onto these platforms and you, and you create um, a quick connection. So as an advertiser, you can quite quickly find 10 relevant influencers. So all these platforms have done, they're, they're doing nothing special other than connecting advertisers with influencers. Now, the reason I've just spent some time saying that is historically the overhead with trying to run influencer marketing was all the admin around finding the people in the first place and then working with them and then paying with them and then vetting their results. It took way more time than the actual value stuff, which is creating the content and sharing it um, as, as, as um, uh, you know, sharing it with the brand. And, and so because these platforms have now come along, uh, to answer your question directly, Emily, I think influencer marketing has a, has a huge role to play. And going forward, mm -hmm. I think you can almost imagine it as a component of uh, a full, uh, like a, you know, the full social advertising strategy that, you know, that I've been referring to where you've got awareness covered and engagement and conversion covered and you've got different channels. And some of them are social media advertising channels. Some of them are search advertising channels and some of them are influencer advertising or influencer engagement channels because these platforms are just make it so more stream so much so much more streamlined advertisers are now able to do it, even small advertisers cost effectively which wasn't necessarily the case a few years ago in my opinion um, now that's that's me sort of giving my sort of 10 cents but what what do you think emily i think do you, do you guys work with influencers yeah so i'll see if my um Thing will work again um i i'm not too sure how it's worked i know we've contacted influencers and invited them in for a drink i saw some of the activity over the weekend like there were blue tick people um from my personal opinion i think people are becoming more skeptical of them um i i try and avoid them at all costs on social media um you can tell who who's genuine and who just does every single product under the sun just to get a living um so i i think it's very dependent and you know case by case it's a, about aligning the brand to the influencer but i think there is increasingly growing skepticism about them and it's, it's how you tackle that yeah those are some good points any any thoughts danny have you guys done anything with influencers um, I think we had one attempt around a digital content creator type event that's held. Um, I don't think a lot of forward planning went into it, but outside of work, outside of the film school, I do see some successful stuff on Twitter at the moment, which is trying to involve people who are less influencers as they're full-time job but people that maybe are present and known within the industry and who have a kind of a profile and maybe by I see it a lot with the film industry so when a film is coming out soon they come up with a little kind of goodie bag of themed items for that film they send it to that person they're obviously asking them to tweet a photo of it um, and they're doing that but those people tend to be people that actually work in the industry full-time or maybe they're film critics or something like that so um, I guess that complements and it works around what you were saying, Emily, which is like it kind of devalues it if it's just somebody that you know is just selling their time to absolutely anyone, the highest bidder, whoever wants to to purchase that. Yeah, um, I think it has, has more clout if it's somebody that is respected within that realm. Yeah, I think yeah, I think both of those are really good points, um, meaning that the term that sometimes uses micro influencer. So they don't necessarily, you know, they're not they don't have a million followers. They might have, you know, 10,000 or even a thousand. I, I think the thresholds are low, but it's an engaged following. And, and as you rightly say, Danny, they, they're, they're, they're genuinely authoritative and, and typically obviously ideally respected on the subject. Um, or, or at least they have a strong opinion on the subject. It might not necessarily be everyone else's opinion, but it's, it's, they create engagement. 
and and it's those micro influences that are, that um, I, I should have qualified my answer. I agree actually with with what I think Emily's saying. I think you're saying the same, Danny. That if you kind of just trying to sign up a, a big celebrity to sort of push your stuff, there might be a space for that for for some big global brands. But I I I think the trend is probably moving away from that and towards can we work with a larger group of micro influencers because obviously they don't have the same reach but if for the same you know sounds sort of silly saying it this way but if for the price of of a you know of a of a hollywood star you can get access to you know 50 or 100 micro influencers and you can have the same reach but probably potentially much more engagement and probably what's what both of you are saying is, is and it's the main point is it's going to you know it's going to be more genuine especially if the way that you structure the campaign is genuine um and i suppose the point i was making about the, these platforms automating the connect the the meet and greet process between advertisers and relevant micro influencers and then automating the way they get paid and automating the, the reporting of the results um means that you can do you can take that approach because I think the reason why historically advertisers might have focused on one or two big names is because it was too much admin to work with, you know, a much larger number of smaller influencers. Mm. I think thrown into that as well, the whole definition of the inf what's the difference between an influencer and, um, and an ambassador, you know, so in Neil's company, there are people who, who I know who have, you know, who are really well known within that industry. So they, that is an, that's an ambassador and that, you know, they work with the company. So they're, you know, just by default, there's already a connection. Um, I and, think, and I think, sorry, go sorry. On. actually saying that the ambassador word seems quite good because we're called Knuts and we're named after our founder, Jens Knuts. And he is, he is quite a character. When you meet him, you don't forget him. And, you know, when we're going, we're trying to get around to lots of different events this year and everyone keeps asking if the end is coming. So I suppose in some ways, although he's the founder, he is also the ambassador for the company. So that's quite an interesting point you've made on that because I haven't really considered that from a marketing perspective. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and um, you know, occasionally, because obviously I'm, 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 becoming a bit dated these days so when i want to know about that some of these up and coming channels like tiktok and you know and when i want to get a gen x um sorry a gen z a gen z or even gen alpha there's the one below them but I, I so i'll often sort of speak to my daughters about you know what they see happening on social networks and things and and i i think there's a trend for certainly brands that are very focused on on gen z is to sort of everyone who works for them is an influencer so well, you know, e e even if you've got physical stores and you work in the shop till, it's almost expected of you to be active on social me media. And I, I do think I can see as we, as, as Gen Z become, you know, in their 20s and 30s and older, that a, f a future sort of workplace is, it's going to be part, almost part of your job description to be influential on your, within your, your own personal networks. Now that, again, is going to raise interesting questions, but I think I can see it moving that way. Okay. Cool, thank you. That's uh, all right. No, thank you. There's some really good, um, interesting points there. So I'll, I'll go into the last section now. And in this section, I'm going to go in detail on the Facebook and Instagram uh, targeting capabilities specifically. We'll just talk about how it works. And then we'll do the same for LinkedIn. So you can get contrast for both of them. Um, I'll move through it relatively quickly so we can have a QA. and a in the slides, I won't go through them today, but when you download them, if you want to download them from the LinkedIn, there's the same information that I'm going to show you now for Facebook and Instagram. It's the same for Twitter, and we've got the same for the Snapchat in there as well. And then there's some more stats. It's all in the appendix of, of the slides. Um, but I'll go through. I'll go through these channels now because it will give you a good idea of how this this targeting <coughs> capability works. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing my screen. Right, Facebook, Instagram, let's, let's start. So I mentioned sort of campaign objectives. So when you go into, uh, into the Facebook you know, ads manager, which is a piece of software that will let you manage Facebook advertising, but you know, as we keep saying, Instagram uh, advertising as well, and then 
um, you know, some of, some of the other partner channels that Facebook and Instagram have, you before you kick off any campaign, which would sit under an account, so you typically, just like AdWords, you've got an organizational company account and then a whole bunch of campaigns that sit under them. And at the campaign level, you do pick your, your objective and then underneath the top level objective, uh, Facebook ads at the moment have all of these really specific uh, objectives that you can pick. And depending on what you pick, the defaults for the way it structures the campaign will be orientated in a way that, that lends you know, towards that specific objective. So, you know, as we said, sort of we mentioned earlier, beg your pardon, if you're going for awareness, then the, probably the key metric would be co- number of impressions and the cost per impressions. Consideration typically is going to be cost per click and number of clicks. Conversion typically would be the cost per conversion. In order to, to, do, to run any conversion-focused campaign uh, and to get the right metrics out, you have to have analytics set up. You have to have the tracking code set up on the right landing pages. And then we have to get Facebook ads manager talking to our analytics and then the systems can report back and, and then we can actually measure the cost per conversion if it's if it's a conversion that can be measured on, on the website, which typically it is. <clears throat> yeah, I think that the rest is self-explanatory. Um, and then and then so the targeting options. So I've I've mentioned that all of the social platforms allow you to be really specific, but Facebook is the most. So it has different types of targeting. The first type of targeting is is the demographic targeting. And underneath demographic, you've obviously, you can go your age range, you can go your gender, the the location where the person's at, their their first language. I I mentioned already about life events. So this stuff is is what, you know, not just, this stuff is what Facebook is picking up through through its you know, spying on us for want of a better word, you know, so that those life events, is not just about what we type into Facebook, it's inferring that from a much wider activity even beyond Facebook. You know, education level, you know, we were speaking about work, so the place where we work, you know, again, that could be inferred by, by the algorithms that are, that are sort of tracking our behavior. Information about our financial status information about you know our relationships so there's a connection between us and our parents and siblings and and cousins and and so all of these all of these uh, options are open to to advertisers and, and the way it works is you know it, it goes down so these i suppose the thing to say is you know it's it's age but you know uh, below age you know we can go or oh, sorry We've, we've spoken about parents. So it's not just, are you parents or not? It's, are you a parent of a child that's between zero and 12 months, one and two, three and five, six and eight, eight and 12. So you can be really, really granular. And when you go through these, uh, these sort of, uh, when you go through the ad platforms, as you set up the targeting for a specific uh, ad group that would sit underneath the campaign, you're, you're, what you're really trying to do is reflect this particular subset of audience that we decided we want to go after with a specific message. So the reason why you would be this granular is if you wanted to vary the message based on whether if we are, for example, a product that's targeting parents, oh, you're going to have a materially different message between someone who's got his parents of, of children under the age of five versus over the age of five. And we can be as granular as we want. And at the same time, the tool will always tell us how many people uh, would fit the targeting options that we've set up. And and the other thing to say here, obviously, is we can have a combination of all of these things. It doesn't have to be one index. We can have as many as we want. Obviously, the more focused we get, the the smaller the the potential audience that we'll reach. And then Facebook tends to have this, this sort of red is too specific. You won't really reach anyone. Yellow is a bit too broad. You'll reach lots of people, but you won't get cut through because your your targeting is too broad. The idea with social advertising is you want to be specific enough so that that there's a reasonable number of people that we can reach, but we're also getting through with a specific message that they can actually respond to. And so the green indicates you're about right. 
Um, and then, you know, apart from demographic targeting, we can also target by people's interests. So I'm sure you can imagine, oh, beg your I'm sure you can imagine how this is inferred. This is a lot to do with our activity, you know, what, what we like on Facebook, what we read, what we scroll on, over and, you know, what we're most engaged with. And, you know, that these are the top level categories and, you know, you can, you can go into an enormous amount of detail. Um, and there are even, uh, there are even groups underneath these as well. And then there's behavior targeting, which is based on our, on our actual activity, but it's also those, uh, those, uh, you know, those life events, which you can infer from some of its other inputs. Um, have we got an anniversary coming up? You know, what's our, what sort of purchases do we make online? So on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I've mentioned, uh, I've mentioned already, I think I've spoken a little bit about custom audiences. Um, again, there's, there's a sort of a wide variety of ways that we can approach this, but so we can connect if we've got a list of email addresses and, you know, and that's obviously it needs to be a, these days, a GDBR compliant list. Yeah, if it's a list of clients and it's legitimate interest, that's okay. We can upload uh, a contact list and then we've got a very specific audience targeting, which is the people on that list. So the way that Facebook will work that is if, it, um, if we upload an email address, even if it's not necessarily their primary email address on their Facebook account, if Facebook using its targeting knowledge, its big, you know, its big brother brain, can connect that person to an individual, it will allow us to reach that person with, with a specific campaign. I sort of spoken about, um, you know, how remarketing works. So if we run a specific awareness campaign that sent people to a web page, and we've got analytics set up, we can, uh, and we've got the Facebook cookie on our on our web pages, um, which if you're running advertising with a digital you know, agency that's doing it properly, all of these things will have the capability to do this. You can say, I want to advertise to all of the people who've been to this particular product page in the last, you know, in the last two weeks or four weeks or whatever. And, and then we can, you know, take that cookie data. So even if we don't know who they are, the cookie data will allow us to, will allow Facebook's advertising platform to match those cookies to individuals on its platform. Um, you know, that we can talk about app users, people who've downloaded an app, but then it's also this other thing called lookalike audience targeting, which is another form of custom list. It's, it's quite important. It's quite widely used. So the way this one works is, you know, if you're an e-commerce uh, website, for example, and you've had, you know, 10,000 different customers over the last year, you could take that list, upload it to Facebook and say, right, I don't want to advertise to those 10,000 because, you know, I've got a campaign that does that. But I want you, Facebook, to tell me that that people that look like uh, that look like these ten thousand, and Facebook's gonna, um, based on its on all of the targeting capabilities that we've already spoken about, Facebook can say from a demographic and interest and behavioural point of view, here's another ten thousand people that aren't those ten thousand. There's no crossover. They're different people, but they look like them from a behavioural interest demographic point of view and we can as advertisers we can uh we can slant it in whichever way we want we want people to behave like them or have similar interests or demographic or you know or a combination of those things and so that works that's obviously as i'm sure you can imagine a very effective tactic and you know it's quite widely used <clears throat> in terms of the actual ad placements i mean i don't need to talk much about this year it, we all we all use facebook so we see them but you know we we can go in all these places um you know messages sites apps um you know wherever facebook is you can normally find an ad there's different ad formats um i think we might i'm not sure if we've touched on this but i'll sort of say it then so typically um something like a video ad or potentially a carousel ad, for example, will work really, really well at the top of the funnel. So if we want to create awareness um, of a product, it's, you know, videos work well, carousels work well. And, and then if we 
if we want to convert those users, so we have a separate campaign with a separate objective that's more about click onto a web page and take an action, then typically image ads are actually the most effective. So if you want to actually convert someone, if we run a video for our awareness campaign and then we take a, a custom audience that says, I want all of the people that watched 50% of that video and then I put uh, and then I put them in a conversion focused campaign and I serve them an image ad that has a nice image and obviously most importantly, a good call to action and a button so they can click onto a page. Then because it's just nice and clear and quick and simple, image ads tend to create you know, the best conversion rates for, for the sort of scenario I've just described there. Obviously offer ads can work in a similar way. Um, collections, there's lead generation ads. So this, this is like, the idea here is that there's a form actually within Facebook. So we don't actually need to send users out of Facebook, which can sometimes be a barrier, but we can present them a form from within Facebook. And when that form is filled, uh, the data is going to end up in our, in our ad platform and be available to us. Um, just quickly then, some advantages, highly targeted, as we said, really great for targeting, you know, as I sort of touched on, it can work for B2B, you know, but it's definitely great for B2C. You know, it's, it's very widely used around the world. Now, Facebook is increasingly strict in terms of its compliance. So you, there is a, there's a lot of compliance you need to go through to get ads approved. They're not automatically approved. They sit in, in an approval uh, sort of funnel and it can take a while for ads to get approved. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk briefly about LinkedIn and then we'll drop in for a Q&A. So similar, very similar sort of um, approach to the whole thing. It just, the look and feel is a bit different. So it's the same ob objective. You can pick your awareness, brand awareness. You know, there's, there's three, uh, there's consideration and there's three sort of sub objectives that sit underneath consideration. I want people to visit my website. I want people to engage with, with the ads. I want uh, people to watch my video. Um, the, the form filling, the in the in app form filling capability, you know, L LinkedIn has lead generation forms that, that work in a similar way to, to what I was just talking about for Facebook. Um, it can also track end conversions. So if a LinkedIn ad sends a user to a website, you can you can track what they did on that website in the same way as you can do with the other platforms. Uh, the targeting capabilities, obviously, from a B2B perspective, Neil quite rightly said, is, is really, really great. Uh, you can go buy job experience, buy the company, and as you've got the other things in there, interests and education and demographics. And LinkedIn's developing its ad capability very impressively and quickly. Um, in terms of ad types, you know, the classic one you'll see is the sponsored content that will appear in the feeds of, obviously, the profiles that fit with the targeting that we've set up. Um, these these are actually the forms I was just talking about. So they might look like this. If you click on an ad, then you will get to a, a form. And because it's going to take the data from your LinkedIn profile, typically you just have to press submit. So really all you're doing is opting into <coughs> sharing your actual contact detail with the with de data with the advertiser. And then sponsored emails, you know, again, if it correctly used, can be really powerful in LinkedIn. So you can send sponsored in the mails. So that's the, the mail capability inside LinkedIn to target users. Uh, you've got dynamic ads that appear on the right hand side and text ads. Um, advantages, you know, it's, uh, it's excellent targeting from a B2B perspective, as we said. And, you know, as we mentioned right at the start of this, it is a bit more expensive relative to Facebook. But I, I think that's a bit unfair because it's all about conversion rates. Uh, but if you look at it plainly, the cost per clicks are a bit more expensive. It, it definitely doesn't cut through quite so well with, with young audiences. Uh, there's, you've got enough sort of experience to be able to, to sort of say that now, um, even if, if it's a B2B play, you know, it's an interesting side note. Um, and that, that is the end. I mean, I've put a question here, but actually I feel like, you know, just, just let's just let's just um, get into a final chat. Has anyone got anything they would like to start with? I think mine's been answered. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I just wondered if it was something that Emily brought up earlier, about, uh, and you said ambassadors earlier. The, mm. the ambassador thing, I think, could probably work for us in B2B. When it comes to influencers, uh, I don't think so much. Um, and Elliot, um, sorry, Emily's point where you see some of these TV programs that are clearly based around reality TV stars trying to get as much product on the screen as they possibly can. Um, I think is it kind of switches me off. Um, I've, I've noticed on a couple of these reality TV programs, different people are driving the same car and pretending it's their own. I mean, <laughs> I mean they're, they're even driving around in the same car and it's the same registration number from one series to the next. Um, and I, I find it hilarious. Um, and I think someone that's in that retail space, I think people will soon become and get tired of those types of people. Um, and I think even the, the younger generation will soon become bored of it and see through it for, for what it really is. It is just human advertising. It's a human, they're a human billboard. Um, but I think um, the ambassador thing, I think is something that I'm going to take away from tonight and I have a look and see, because we've got some really highly influential people that work for us. Um, and I think that could be a, a good route for us for, for digital marketing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think I think you're right, Neil. Um, is it it's not made in Chelsea, is it that you're referring to? Uh no, it's <laughs> it, it, it's it's um well it's Towie is the is the big oh, one. Oh Towie, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's a massive one. And then some of the offshoots from that that my other half watches religiously, and I said, right, I wonder what she's gonna be wearing, she's gonna keep telling us about <laughs> the, the, this stuff. Uh it, it it becomes quite dull after a while and i think people will soon get switched off by it but yeah yeah, it was, yeah. yeah Ta Taui, it was just range rovers and audis um that were literally being passed around the, the car which I, which I found hilarious yeah. no i think it's uh, ideally the best any form of marketing communication i mean i don't i think in my view it's, it's just a personal view is that i don't think people mind advertising if it's if it's relevant and you know and, and ideally authentic and you're right the risk the risk of those of, of i guess influences in the broader sense of of just pushing any old thing is that the, the authenticity goes away yeah which definitely for gen z for everyone it's a turn off but actually i think it's even more of a turn off in some ways for, for gen z um who who really have no time for for unauthentic messaging at all yeah. Okay. <clears throat> any 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 more points? Uh Danny, any thoughts? Are you on mute, mate? <laughs> that hasn't happened to me in a while. I always <laughs> judge other people, but <laughs> um I was gonna say that um my own involvement with social media advertising is mostly so far just limited to sponsoring posts through Facebook. So a lot of the specifying the audience and the interests and the demographic I'm quite familiar with. And I do try and play around between different types of, um, of doing that on Facebook between kind of um, awareness and engagement. Um, but it's not me within the team who's responsible for the larger campaigns and do the ad campaign stuff. So, I feel like that's a real gap in my knowledge and something I need to explore a lot more to try and understand how that side works. Cause after all, that's where the larger amount of money gets spent. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of work said, um, to do there. Facebook. I mean, I, I do, I try to get good at it. Um, but that whole idea that it's so granular it is quite a time consuming process. And when, particularly when you're trying to make it work for Instagram as well, then I mean, really you to do something like that properly, you do need to spend a lot of time on it. And I suppose for us as a university selling a, a lot of different courses, something I think I go back to a lot in these sessions that because we're selling to different courses in different specialisms to different people of different age brackets at different places all over the world. There's so many different paid advertising campaigns going on at the same time. So it is quite a lot to try and get your head around. Um, but it's certainly something that we have to do because we're, we 
a lot of our audience are predominantly young and they're they're on social media so it's it's really important for the school yeah absolutely and i think yeah i've mentioned it a couple of times a lot of the universities and higher education institutes are big spenders on the platforms because it's very important but what you should do danny is join the join the quarterly business reviews mm. um, because it, you know, i think it makes sense for you to to be on there anyway you know from an organic social media perspective, it would be of interest. And then if you join them, you know, I think, you know, uh, you might find it interesting and it might be a route in to, for sort of upping your knowledge. Because I, I do think there, there is, although they, they probably are separate tactics, organic and paid, you know, it makes sense for you to have knowledge of, you know, either side. I think the, another reason why it would be good for me to be involved, and, and this would be the truth for any company, that has people working in those different capacities like we do is just that um, you don't want to end up having two different feels and styles to what is coming out of one platform or channel and they have to complement each other. And that might just be in terms of the copy or the imagery that's used, but if they feel very separate, I don't know. I feel, I, I don't think that's a good look. And you know, I think sometimes uh, we have issues around that and there's improvements to be made. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's a very good point. That's a definitely a good point. Okay. Uh, Lucy, anything? anything to um, I, I just, I, I'm actually quite flabbergasted as to the, the specific target audience that, that you could actually um, get get your um, promotion out to. Um, for, for me, that's really, really interesting. Um, I, I always thought that that perhaps even with LinkedIn um, and the, the the B2B platforms um, that, that I didn't realize that you could be that granular. So I I I, I feel that you, you could perhaps do quite a good targeted campaign on LinkedIn. Um, and I think that that could work quite well for us. Um, I also think, obviously, I, I don't know the full costs and, 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 and how that side of things would work, but I also see how the likes of Facebook um, could work really well in order to actually grow communities for existing clients. And it could also be an additional revenue stream, uh, potential revenue stream um, for our perspective to, for, to do that. Um, so it, it's been really interesting to, to, to understand how it can work from both a user and from a client perspective um, and, and the amount of detail that you can go into. Um, crazy. <laughs> um, but also fantastic. It, 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 my only concern would be um, you would have to be very, very, very granular in order to find someone who was looking to purchase rather than someone who's just interested in the possibility or has an issue um, they may have an issue but they might not have a, a they, they not might not be prepared to make that commitment so it could be a, a spend for a, a long-term investment effectively rather than um, the short term but yeah really really interesting that, that final point you made on is, is a really good one it's relevant for some people you know put potentially Neil as well but so we're, so we're talking to um like a company an engineering company uh that you know is a relatively small focused engineering company that builds water a new type of water desalination plant um and they're looking you know over the next uh two decades to sort of sell these these plants these uh you know pieces of equipment into places around the world where water sh shortage is, is a big issue so you can imagine that's so specific in terms of geography, in terms of the decision makers. It's, it's a really specific number of people. And so they're looking at a LinkedIn advertising campaign, whether, whether they do it with us or not. It makes, it makes strategic sense for them to set up a really targeted campaign, just going after these few hundred or few thousand at most people. Because it, it's not going to cost them very much at all, because the impressions are not going to be that high. The clicks, you know, there'll be a handful of clicks. But those clicks that do come through are potentially really, really valuable because obviously you're talking about high, high sort of ticket item there. So, you know, the universities who are getting tens of thousands of people signing up every year or depending on the size of the institution, they've got, clearly got to spend you know, quite, quite a lot of money. If you're 
yeah, if you're a B2B player, a bit more niche, or you know, any anyone who's a bit more niche, you don't necessarily have to spend large amounts of money. And it's definitely not going to be, it's not going to be necessarily the focus of your entire marketing strategy, but as a component that can support it, yeah, you know, it's, it's worth looking at. Yeah, it is really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh Emily, any any final point from you? No, I I think I think I've spoken enough today. <laughs> <laughs> I think I filled up a big can of worms, but no, again, really interesting, really enjoyed the discussion aspect today. So I'm looking at the whole screen. Yeah, no, no, a, I've really enjoyed the discussion as well. And I think um, the more the more we do these things, I think that's the most valuable component. Uh, so thank you, like so much for your questions and everyone today. Uh, I've really enjoyed it again. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening. You too. Bye.